Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you live. My name is Sean and I'm a student at the Faculty of Business. Thank you all for joining us at tonight's event. Today's even this evening's event will be divided into three segments. The first will be a 10 minute talk by our speaker, Minister Ng Ying Hen. The second part will be a 20 minute interview with Viswa Sadasivan, chairman of the ULIVE organizing committee. Finally, there will be a 30 minute question and answer session. If you would like to pose a question, please make your way to the two aisles where the microphones are located. Introduce yourself and speak clearly into the microphones. This will allow our online community to be able to hear your question as well. This evening, we will be using Pigeonhole Live for our question and answer session as well. Pigeonhole Live is an online application which will allow you to post your questions online. In order to access Pigeonhole Live, simply go to your smartphone's internet browser, key in phlive.at. Again, that's phlive.at. Once you're in, you need to key in our event passcode, which is UALIVE. U-A-L-I-V-E. Once you're in the website, please select the top choice, which is You Alive featuring Minister Ng Ing Hen. And once you're in, you're able to pose questions that you would like to ask the minister. You will also be able to vote for questions that are already posed. To do so, simply click on the arrow beside each of the questions. Questions that have higher popularity have a higher chance of being answered by the speaker. So without further ado, Please, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, Minister Ng Ing Hen. Can you hear me? Oh, good. I hope you. Uh, well, first, let me wish everybody a happy new year. A happy year of the horse. How many horses are there here? Uh, not too bad. <laughs> you have a double lung power, it seems. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll sit. I'm uh, fairly tall and. Uh, uh, on record as having removed a disc, so it allows me to sit. And uh, I'm a surgeon by training, as you know, and the two risk factors for, uh, by way of introduction, since I'm talking about bad backs, uh, there are two risk factors for uh, prolap intervertebral disc. One, if you're tall, above 1.65, I think. And second, guess what? Truck drivers. In multivariate analyses, these are the two factors that got selected. I think it's because they... So, uh, Vishwa approached me and Chochan sent me an email and he said, uh, would you mind speaking at you live? And uh, it's always a pleasure to come back because this is my alumnus. And uh, to meet up with students and faculty. So uh, I said yes. Uh, I didn't quite... Uh, recognize what I was getting into because then Vishwa uh, came up and said, uh, well, you have 10 minutes to basically tell us what you believe in. And uh, there'll be questions asked on defense, which is, which is, which is I expect. Um, so it got me thinking uh, what I actually wanted to say to you. Uh, and I thought rather than share about defense perspectives, which will come up during the Q&A, uh, it'd be <clears throat> better if I shared uh, about what drives me, what uh, forms my opinions, my perspectives. Uh, as leaders, in it, we, we try to be objective, but if truth be told, uh, all of us view life through our own prism. 
that's shaped by our own experiences. There's a prism that we might see the same information but come up with different interpretations and conclusions. So I, I intend to be brief because it's much better and more lively of an interaction, so I want to move on to that. And I thought there were two uh, main points that I wanted to share. Uh, my set of beliefs and uh, related to those set of beliefs, why I believe, uh, believe what I do. Uh, the first thing, I, my first set of beliefs revolves uh, this uh, simple assertion and I would say uh, deep conviction that for me, uh, Singapore must always be a land of opportunity especially for the young and vulnerable. Uh, I say a deep set of beliefs because uh, of my own uh, life experience. I grew up poor. Uh, I come from a family with, uh, uh, of six brothers and sisters. And my earliest recollection, uh, I think this was before I went to school, uh, was uh, my house. Uh, it was in, my birth certificate says I was born in Zion Road. How many of you know where Zion Road is? Well, all of you know where Zion Road is. Now, your recollection of Zion Road is comp might be very, very different from mine. Today, Zion Road is very gentrified, right? There's a great Nasi Parang there, uh, the Hawker Centre there, and there's a beautiful Alexandra Canal. Uh, my visual memories of Zion Road are completely different from that. Uh, there was a canal in front, Alexandra Canal, but it was not in any shape or form like today. Uh, in fact, it overflowed its banks. I don't think there were railings. I mean, if you fell, if you fell in, you fell in. Uh, my auditory memories of Zion Road are very different from yours because what I can remember is my mom uh, scolding me that I would be swept away by currents and die and I deserve it. Now, she didn't say in that refined English, it was actually in Hokkien, which I cannot repeat. <laughs> but that was my earliest memories. Uh, they were actually fond memories. I didn't know it then, but I actually lived in what today you call interim rental housing scheme, where a number of families share one flat. Uh, because one family, whether you're three, four, five, or six, lived in one room. And then you shared, and then you had space at night, you, you sleep in the living room. Uh, and Zion Road, uh, for those of you who are old enough, was a very different place, as I said. It was near, how many of you remember Great World? The old Great World, not today's Great World. Okay, you know, let's test the memory. How many of you remember Sky Theatre? You're showing your age. <laughs> How many of you remember the cabaret there? It was a very colourful area. Uh, and, the, and as I said, my auditory memories are different because what I remember was the man in the back street with his cock cock. And I was, uh, you lift up stairs and if you want uh, noodles, you send him a basket from the top. And uh, he's carrying his wares. He, he makes a bowl of uh, me and he puts it and then you roll it up. It's a trust system. You could eat it, but you have to throw money down. That's the way it works. Uh, we got better. And uh, next thing we knew, we lived in Queenstown. It was a three-room flat. Uh, and for some reason or other, my, my, my parents enrolled me in a school, uh, uh, which was Anglo-Chinese school. How many alumni from <laughs> ACS? Uh, I think that made a big difference, uh, and uh, after that, I went to NJC. Did f well enough to enter NUS Medicine, so uh, as I said, I'm an alumnus. Now, I got my MBBS and Masters from uh, this university, but uh, one of the greatest treasures uh, from NUS was uh, because I met my wife in NUS. She was a classmate of mine, uh, and we got married uh, in housemanship year, uh, when we were 24. We got, we got married between one second and third posting and somehow planned the wedding and, and now we have a family of uh, four kids. And there was something else which I was very indebted to the system, was that both of us were sent for 
uh, higher manpower training. It's called HMDP, High Power Man Manpower Development Program. And uh, after I got the master's and fellowship from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh here, uh, did post-grad training in, in, we call it cancer surgery in both New York and uh, MD Anderson, which is University of Texas. Uh, when I was in New York, uh, my wife had similar scholarship and she went to Mount Sinai to do her genetics. Uh, on top of that, she gave birth in, when she was doing a fellowship. So I have great regard for women. They can do double what men do. Uh, uh, she, she was doing her experiments and she delivered on Friday. And because she was doing some culture of some stuff, and she went back on, Monday, on Sunday uh, to make sure that you know, the cultures were still alive. And, I, and the boss was very, very uh, impressed, so was I. Uh, then we went to Houston, and uh, she went to uh, Baylor at that time to do genetics. Uh, so in the last five minutes, I brought you when I was four to about 30. After this, I asked myself, how is it that a poor boy from Queenstown interim rental scheme, three-room flat, can one day end up in the top cancer centers of the world. How is it possible? Within 20 years, a poverty cycle gets broken. And it wasn't only me, because uh, the friends that I kept in contact with, I knew that they themselves had been lifted out of poverty, and the figures were very stark in terms of you know, whatever metric you're looking at, university education, uh, uh, employment, salary, so on. So how is it possible that there was a mass effect that basically lifted all boats? And you might have your own uh, conclusions, but this is my second point, that the Singapore system, however you define it, the Singapore system that allowed such great social mobility that changed basically a society was virtuous, had to be protected and nurtured, but updated. And, it, and I don't want to go into what I think the Singapore system is uh, in great depth, because I'm sure that we can talk about that. But if I asked you, what did you think uh, were the main aspects of our Singapore system that allowed this virtuous state of affairs, we might get very interesting answers. And I thought about it, and what is it about our Singapore system that allowed this to happen? And very quickly, I, I thought of five for myself, what I thought were key aspects of the system. First of all was that we, what we agreed on and what we actually agreed against. The first aspect was that we all agreed in that generation. We, again, we, we, we fought against communalism and agreed on secularism. We tried to protect our common space. And today, I think that's a big challenge. Because if you look at the polls, all societies are more and more polarized. The common space is actually shrinking. Um, that was the reason that formed the basis of our ethnic ratios in our, in our, in our schools. Uh, not in our schools, but in our uh, housing estates, uh, use of English for common language, so on and so forth. The second th uh, aspect, I thought, of the Singapore system was, was that we, we, all of us valued meritocracy and fought against social welfareism. Related to that was the family as the nuclear unit, as the main component of society, as the main support structure. And I think even that is being eroded. Uh, the fourth aspect is that we could agree on our common vulnerabilities. And lastly, I think uh, we could agree on a very strong national defense and security. To me, these were the five aspects, if you like, that sharpened uh, our generation's ability and the system to be able to produce so many virtuous results. And uh, you know, I keep in touch with many of my old friends, and I see the same thing that happened uh, to me happen to them. Uh, so I'm going to end here. 
uh, and, I'm, uh, and Vishwa, I'm sure, will have very uh, good questions. But uh, when I answer you, uh, I, I thought it'd be use it was useful for me to share where I'm coming from and why it's so very difficult sometimes for me to divorce myself from what I feel are the positive aspects in the system. But I love to be challenged. I love for you to uh, give me your views, to say what, what things we need to change drastically. What are the fun even the fundamentals that you think we take away, we should take away and what we should add. Because this is, I think, what makes, uh, will make Singapore stronger. So thank you. Hi, Minister. Thank you. <coughs> First of all, a big thank you to you. I know how busy you are. Um, the only thing he was, he came across very personable. It's not often that we see ministers so personable. I mean, th this is a problem we have in Singapore. You know, ministers come across almost by definition stodgy, bureaucratic, unimaginative. Uh, I can but, perform the role if you like. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure very well too. But it's, it's a pity that we don't have enough opportunities to get to see and understand our ministers, our leaders, like you. The, the, I mean, you didn't speak for long, mm. but what you said came from the heart and it gave us a sense of who is leading us. I think today that's a quandary. That's the situation we are in. Many of us, we know the persona, but we don't know the person. I think it's about time. We have a lot more opportunities for Singaporeans who have the onerous task of casting the vote on election day to know who is leading us. The person, not the personage or the persona. Well, I accept that as a, a reality, but you know, our DNA... Uh, and it, a lot of it is formed from Lee Kuan Yew's views. Lee Kuan Yew never believed in the personality politics. Uh, when, uh, you know, when Simeus was a Dutch yeah. uh, advisor, and if you read Lee Kuan Yew's book, uh, when, Se when Simeus looked at our economy, and, uh, you know, at that time, and he, 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 t he gave uh, Lee Kuan Yew some advice, and... Uh, which was also to leave the statue of Sir Samford Raffles, yes. which uh, Lee Kuan Yew did. But uh, that generation never believed uh, that they should push themselves. And I'm of the old school. I, I just think that if you can't see uh, through uh, sometimes fluff and, uh, well, what you see is what you get, and you know there are opportunities like this. I'm happy to speak to you, but I, I, uh, I must tell you, I'm not a great user of uh, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, sometimes uh, if you want me to, I'll try. Uh, but I rather you know sit down with you and over a meal just talk. Uh, I don't need uh, tens of thousands knowing what I'm doing at any given point of time. But that's well, me. Well. <laughs> There's going to be a meal later, <laughs> so you can talk. Um, you talked about how you grew up, the circumstances, and many of us here, especially those in the front row, can relate to that. Um, many of us came, grew up poor, in poor circumstances, and Singapore, in so many ways, gave us opportunities that others, other countries wouldn't have. Um, I mean, one of the things is, I remember going to RI. Uh, those days, 90% of the school, in about the same time as we went to school, 90% uh, were poor. Today, the median income has gone up. 90% of the cohort in RI would be fairly rich or well off. Not that the government is selecting the rich to go to, but that is the nature of meritocracy unbridled meritocracy. Um, and it does cause discontent. It does make a premier institution like RI um, a seat for elitism if we don't watch it. You know, this is something we, we, we talked about. What are your views on this? 
Well, schooling and, and social mobility is a big issue, uh, with, and, and, and Vishwa is correct. Uh, but it doesn't only relate just to opportunities through school. The larger question is, for our generation, as Viswa said, uh, when only 5% went to universities, mm. and say 10 to 20% were housing, you can define what makes life better quite easily because there was a mass effect. But if I ask us now where you know, the ownership of houses, about 90% of the population own houses, X percent uh, have, are able to get degrees. In fact, for both local and foreign, it's over half and so on. And what is the definition of a better life, if you like, in 20 years? And how do you make it visible? How do you get people to rally behind? And it can't be more materialism. It can't be a higher percentage of uh, everyone getting degrees, because that's what the Taiwan system did. Yeah. Uh, Taiwan system, for those of you who are familiar with it, in a sense, politicized uh, tertiary education. And I think at latest count, they have something like 240 universities. And uh, about 90% of every primary one cohort gets a degree. And because of that, graduate unemployment is very high. Graduate unemployment, underemployment is even worse. So it hasn't solved their problem. So it can't be defined, and actually the definition of what it means for a better life is actually harder. Because uh, for some, it's about being green. And, but, you know, I, I, I think it's Limkin's son, but I stand corrected. Uh, and he said to, was it, you have to help me because you either, I can either house you or house your grandfather when it was about homes and graves. Yeah. And you put it in a stark manner, but it was about choices. Now, if we can find a way, for example, that can accommodate more and more uh, wishes, I think that's the way to go, but I I'll be realistic, it's not always easy. Now, let me come back to the question of how do we ensure that our system continues to remain open because that's uh, mm. our preoccupation as well. We're trying very hard and we're trying, if you like, not to have, in that, you use the word unbridled meritocracy. Meritocracy is not wrong, it's never wrong, because it allows everyone to reach the full potential. But we recognize that some are falling, may fall so far back, that even earlier on, you may have to push them right up in front. Through resources, through exposure, you may have to do that because if you left it alone, uh, they're going to be even further back. Now, how much to do, who to do it, we'll have to convince the public. But uh, this is something that we are seeing and it's, we're not alone because in any society that is developed, the more developed a society is, the greater the social stratification. Um, there are many sociologists, so, sociologists here, I believe, and that's true of every society. So we don't want Singapore to go that way where, as PM says, winner takes all. And we will, from time to time, have instruments in which we will try to uh, shake the box up a little bit. But ultimately, it still depends on the individual effort. And that you cannot change. But I, <clears throat> I take your point about the efforts that the government has made to address um, social mobility issues as well as intergenerational social mobility issues. You know. But I think there comes a point where individuals could start feeling disenfranchised. Yep. Uh, it's, it's no fault of the government or no fault of any particular institution or individual, but people feel disenfranchised because the guy yep. next to you has a lot more doors opening for him and you, you are struggling. Uh, it is not about feeling sorry for oneself, but it's about saying, what is in it for me? And over time, that affects your sense of belonging to yeah. society. And that brings me to the question, which is, defense today, national service, is not about technology, is not about the weapons, is not about the leopard tank, it's about the will to fight when the button is pressed. Now, my question to you, 
Minister, is to what extent do you think there is a will to fight today, especially among individuals in Singapore who may have who may be feeling disenfranchised mm. because of the reasons we mentioned. And what is being done by the Ministry of Defence, mm. SAF, to address some of these, these mental blocks or emotional blocks mm. for them to say, I want to give my best to my country, my home. For some of them, my home, my country, the national songs are just words. Yeah. Um, we keep a very close tab on exactly as uh, what Vishwa says, how people feel about uh, Singapore, their family. Uh, a close tab meaning that uh, we take periodic surveys, uh, which people, you know, people are very expressive, so they're very yeah. happy to. And the good thing about NS is that, well, you have time during NS, so you know, for each cohort, you have a, a survey of 20,000. Uh, and they, 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 they're very honest in their opinion. So, uh, and we've been monitoring this over the years. And quite gratifying that the support for national service, and you can ask this in a number of questions, whether you're willing to fight, whether you know you're willing to uh, die, whether what is precious to you, the general support from all these questions have been 90% and above. Now, when I entered the Ministry of Defence 2005, about eight years ago, you know, periodically our psychologists will show these uh, surveys, they're in-house, and you know, I would look at them and say, well, how do we know that, you know, mm. our people are telling us the truth? So, uh, this year, because of our committee to study NS, to strengthen NS, uh, we decided to do something fairly bold. I, I, I asked my chaps, look, you know, we have this in-house service, but let's, let's ask somebody else completely independent to do a survey. Pay them the money, make sure it's statistically rigorous, but beyond that, don't interfere and just allow them to do a proper study. And let's live with the results. Uh, for a politician, that's bold. <laughs> uh, and we got IPS to do it. Institute of Poli Policy Studies, which is you know, attached to LKY School of uh, Public Policy here. And we, I was amazed by the results. They did a, a very rigorous uh, sampling, smaller samples, not 20,000, but enough to satisfy statistical rigor. Uh, as much as possible unbiased because they didn't associate themselves with MINDEM. This was a general population survey that they went into the households. And when they asked the question, what's the percentage of people that supported NS? The answer was 95%. So when they presented to me, you know, I had some training as a research. Uh, I kept trying to shoot, shoot it down. So it must be selected. You know, the person you wasn't at home and you talked to the person and you, and you know, the, your, the researcher was very good. Was, uh, Spoke Dr. to the Leong, maid or something. Leong Chang Ho. And they said, no, no, no. You know, you went through. And I said, is this consistent with methodology of all your stu mm. other studies? He says, yes. You know, this is just standard. There was nothing that I can find that explained the result. And I think there's a good reason for this. One is that being small and vulnerable, uh, people can focus their minds. And the fact is that we are short of babies. Uh, we have about 35, sometimes 38. The last dragon year, about 39,000 babies, where we actually need 50. And people can actually realize that if you don't defend Singapore, if Singaporeans don't defend Singapore, no one else will. And I think Despite, you know, as, as you say, all the stresses and strains, sometimes the complaints about this and that, fundamentally, people believe that in Singapore, this is something worth protecting. This is my home, this is my family, I'll fight for it. But now, you can say, well, how do you know? Suppose the first shot is, is fired and you turn around and you're not sure that there are many there. Maybe. But I will tell you that when we go on to the ground, the two years and after that, uh, sometimes uh, the unbridled enthusiasm, and you should know because you're a volunteer, people who believe that uh, our place is worth defending uh, comes back again and again. And I think that's a real responsibility for us to be able to keep that, and we never take that for granted. But uh, theoretically, you're correct, we never know until, you know... The um, button is pressed. Uh, the button is pressed, but... But you uh, talked about is, vulnerable. Um, that's an interesting word. 
we have been hearing this word for decades now. Mm. And it was Mr. Lee Kuan Yew who first used the term to describe Singapore's state. And it's been termed siege, a mentality of yeah. siege. The question now that I've been hearing from younger Singaporeans mm -hmm. is what vulnerability? We are one of the best performing economies in the world, per capita wise. Uh, we have best airports, we're doing well. So what is this vulnerability we're talking about? And, and with that comes this whole issue of who is our enemy? Why should we spend two years doing national service? I mean, I'm just throwing up yeah. questions which yeah. you must be familiar with. And yeah. then, very importantly, you know, why do we need to spend $12 billion a year for defense? Which, which amounts to 9.4 billion US dollars, hmm. when our neighbors, you take Malaysia for example, you know, they spend uh, 4.2 hmm. billion dollars. So we are spending more than double what Malaysia is spending and our population is 5 billion and their population is 30, almost 30 million. So these questions are coming up because it's a knowledge economy. Individuals are knowledgeable, we are thinking, and we're asking these questions. As these questions are not devoid of logic. Yes. Uh, so what would be your answer to these questions? We should be happy that people are asking these questions. Uh, rather than you know, being, uh, accepting our system as it is, and they are very relevant questions. Uh, and uh, the first level uh, is an assertion and uh, People can choose to believe or not, but uh, there's a saying that the stronger you are, the less enemies you have. And I think that's true. Uh, but I will also tell you that compared to five, maybe eight years ago, uh, I have a less tougher job of convincing people that we are vulnerable. Uh, particularly because over the last five years, the re our region has changed. Uh, in my defense meetings now, my call to my fellow defense ministers, we really ought to get ourselves off the newspapers. <laughs> because every week, there's one or more defense-related articles about tensions rising in the region. And people can see it, even though it's in Northeast Asia. I mean, when uh, the Japanese uh, was reported to say that uh, if uh, their territories were uh, airspace was infringed upon, they would take uh, the necessary action. And China, of course, uh, said that, well, any shooting down of its drones will be an act of war, and that caused people to sit up. Uh, our region is changing drastically. Uh, people recognize that uh, it's actually periods of, uh, there are actually instances of tension, and they're not theoretical because some of you may know that uh, Taiwanese fishermen. Uh, was shot dead by uh, uh, the Philippines, Coast Guards or, or whoever. Uh, and from time to time, there are episodes. Some of you may not remember, but uh, we had a neighbor a couple of years back, some chief of Navy, who uh, was quite outspoken and he said openly, uh, you know, for these ships that we think are smuggling sand, uh, in, in the, the Navy should just ram these ships. Now, if that occurred, and if you didn't have a firm and strong deterrent force, I think Singaporeans will be much less confident about the future. There was one episode this year uh, that piqued me. Remember we had the haze? And I was surprised at how uh, vitriol is probably a good word, mm. how vitriolic uh, Singaporeans got against a much larger neighbour. <laughs> uh, where even you know, we in the defence community were saying, well, let's say things with a bit of more calm and, and less, uh, if you like, aggravation. Because some were saying that you ought to go there and just take independent action. Uh, it's been now 40-odd years since we had the SAF. 
when we first started it, very few believed that Singapore could be defended. Very few believed. Because if you're a military uh, expert or if, you, if you're a strategic uh, analyst, we have very two uh, vulnerable factors which cannot be changed. Our size and our limited manpower. In military terms, if I can be stark, Singapore is a point target, single point. So when we started the SAF, very few people believed that we could have a credible defence. Very few people believe today that we cannot defend ourselves. And very few people think that they can test our defence capabilities without being severely hurt. That's a big achievement. And, and so, you can sleep better at night because of it. So, I'd like to just ask one related question before I throw it open to the floor. So the question here is, um, we are still vulnerable, but is national service the only way forward? I think this is a fundamental question that's being asked. Our national service, if, if you include the operationally ready national servicemen, plus the standing regular force, which is 60, 60 or 1,000, uh, the total strength of Singapore's operationally ready armed force would be in the region of 300 plus 400. You know, it's, it's a significant force, but most of them would be reservists, right? But it's a, it's, it's, it's a force. At what point would we be a defense force and not cross the line and become, be perceived as an offensive force? Because of the capability and capacity. And I think that's a question that's being asked. Uh, do we need to continue this level of, this level of capability uh, at a point where we have moved out of uh, the, the 1960s, 70s, where the, those 80s, uh, 70s were communist threat and other threats? Do we, is it not time for us to scale down a bit? Mm. Do we still need so much of uh, such, such large force? What's, what's your sense? Well, those are good questions because I like those questions. I, I rather have those set of questions and saying, you know, why is it, why is it that you have uh, such a weak force and, you, you know, you're, you've been challenged and you haven't performed and people are, you know, provoking you because uh, you seem to be weak. A paper tiger. A, a paper <laughs> tiger, so on and so forth. So I like your set of questions because the assumptions are that we are already strong and that, you know, will other, others perceive us as uh, being too aggressive? And I would say no because... Uh, we spend an inordinate time uh, making sure that uh, what we call defence diplomacy, in joint exercises, in being very transparent. It's, it's quite hard to hide things in Singapore anyway. So we're being very transparent about what we have, uh, what we use it for, and it's completely deterrent force. Uh, for instance, we had uh, early this year, earlier this year, because of our ASEAN Defence Ministers meeting plus 18 countries, and uh, Brunei hosted it, but we encourage Brunei very much to, to host this exercise and we help them because we basically brought our operating systems for them to use there. We asked them to host an exercise which the teams for, for humanitarian assistance and military medicine. You just imagine this in your mind's eye. 18 nations, right? 10 ASEAN countries, US, Japan, China, Korea, Australia, India, Russia. Troops from 18 militaries descended onto Brunei. Helicopters flew across Brunei. Uh, they evacuated casualties, Japanese, Chinese, American troops. They went to each other's cross deck. And it was really a very good testament of military, mill to mill, what we call mill to mill cooperation. So Singapore is a very strong leader in this field. Uh, we have our C2 center in uh, Changi, where we have a global C maritime C2 picture, meaning command, uh, control. command and control center in, 
And uh, what we've encouraged other countries is to, pl is to put their systems here. It's a plug and play system. Various systems can plug into it and you share what you want and you take what you want from what we produce. And we're able to produce a common maritime picture. So when one of uh, the ships in one of our neighboring countries that were registered was hijacked in the Gulf of uh, Aden in Somalia, we could give them a picture. Yeah. So I don't think uh, we'll continue this current trajectory that our intentions will ever be mis misunderstood. I mean, why would we be aggressors? As no, but our message on deterrence is working. The money that you spend, yes, your tax dollars pays, you're quite right. Our defense budget is a large proportion of our government spending. But I will tell you, it's worth it. I'm very, very conscious of the amount we spend and we want to make sure that whatever we buy makes uh, absolute sense. But I'm also very uh, conscious of the responsibility that SAF and MINDEF has as a custodian of your time. And that's why we're really looking into issues. How can we make NS more meaningful? How can we even make it sharper? How can we make sure that NS is only as long as it's necessary to raise a credible force? I don't take for a moment that strong level of support as license to do whatever we like. In fact, the reverse. the reverse. I take it that this was faith won by my predecessors and we had better continue to keep making sure that we are sharp uh, so that you know, we continue to get the support that we want. Well, thank you. That's a good time to throw it open to the floor. And as I usually say, uh, please don't make speeches. Short, sharp comments. Right, I'm sure there are going to be many comments. Yes, uh, the lady in green. Anybody else? Yes, please come to the microphones. Please um, give your name, your IC number. <laughs> I mean, this is defense and security. Be careful. Huh? <laughs> okay. I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> Yes, please. Um, good evening, Minister. My name is Yvonne. Uh, I'm a student at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Um, my question is, uh, okay, Singapore has historically looked to Israel as a model on which its defence policy was based. Um, recently, you visited Switzerland and Finland uh, to study the conscription systems in both countries. So I was wondering which countries do you think uh, provide the most relevant model for Singapore now? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, uh, we, look, we do look at Israel because they have technology, but we don't uh, look at only one country. And we have been fairly eclectic in looking at uh, various sources. But you mentioned Finland and Switzerland. And uh, to me, uh, there were very useful lessons from both. But Finland was remarkable. Uh, how many Finns here? OK. So I can go and, and say whatever I like about Finland now. <laughs> Finland has such a long history, right? You know, for those of you who, who, who knew, uh, uh, for their, they have a big neighbour, uh, which is Russia, by the way. Uh, Finland and Russia have a common border, land border, 1,300 kilometres long. Finland has the same population as Singapore. 1,300 kilometres is from here to Bangkok. That's just for scale. But when you talk to Finns about defence, they told me that they, every, they exaggerate, of course, but they told me every family has written a book about how their family was involved in some war. <laughs> the passion that came through. I don't wish for any uh, conflict on us to be able to test that passion, but if we are unlucky enough to have it, I hope we can draw strength from other countries. Okay, yourself. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good evening, Mr. Uh, I'm Jen, uh, Jen Chan from uh, Mathematics and Computer Science. Um, <clears throat> my question to you is that, uh, okay, so uh, during the Cold War, right, uh, America had to decide whether to build Fermilab if you don't know what Fermilab is, a famous particle accelerator. So <clears throat> the government at that time was expected to say, how is this going to help beat those commies? Right. So <clears throat> there was a famous answer by a scientist. Uh, it goes like this. 
It has nothing to do directly with defending our country except to help make our country worth defending. So <clears throat> I guess I'm here to repeat that. Of course, I'm not asking you to build a particle accelerator, but <clears throat> about science in general. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm concerned that even though science is at least as important culturally to us, uh, it doesn't get the same amount of attention, not by the government or even the people. <clears throat> uh, in this, I'm not referring to applied research. I know your ministry is a great fan of applied research. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> I'm talking about um, science itself. Science as something that... It's becoming a speech. Well, something that interests people, science, science maybe even as national pride, okay? Uh, so maybe I'll just give you some of the problems that... No, 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 no. Uh, no, no, this, no, 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 this, this is some of the problems the no, no. we have Come to now. the question. What's your question? Okay, because it, it has this problem of uh, like making our parents complain about our school curriculum. Uh, it has problems making... Question. Uh, What's your question, us, young okay, man? Require f importing foreign talent. So the question is, why would you, uh, as a government, choose to, say, promote arts over the science? Uh, <laughs> promote applied research over the basic sciences? Um, yeah. I got your question. You know, a question like that... Well, would let me answer it directly. Uh, you're a, you're, you're, you say you're from... Sam, you're from the Department of Science? Yeah, uh, come and see me after this and we'll talk about uh, basic science research in Mindef for you. Well, let me answer that. Uh, you're, you're, you're actually, I share your sentiment and your preaching to the converted. I say so because uh, the SAF needs not only applied research, uh, we are actually doing a lot of basic research. Because we are a technologically driven force, we have to have multiplier effects. Uh, and between and in the MINDEF family, I employ 5,000 research scientists and engineers. I'm the, one of the biggest employers of scientists and engineers. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And I tell you that commitment will increase because that's the way uh, we'll have. We're able to make sure that we uh, mitigate our effect of not having enough people. And that's the reason why we are so effective in many of our systems. So uh, uh, I share your, your passion, and I will tell you that we will continue to go along those lines. I'm not sure that your statement that the government only supports arts more than science. We treat all children equally. Uh, and we believe that uh, you know, various components will be needed. Uh, uh, so I, I wouldn't want to pigeonhole one or is better than the yeah. other. I had an interesting conversation, for example, with uh, uh, the CEO of Rolls-Royce, mm. uh, uh, Sir Rose, I think. Uh, he's an experimental psychologist, by the way. So I, I, try, I tend to shy away from pigeoning whole people and saying, because you are a scientist, you can't do this, or because you're humanities, you can't do it. Oh, no, you're we have on our IAP and uh, we had the uh, Cambridge uh, uh, Chancellor, I don't know what you call her now, Rector or President. And she had a great experience of uh, teaching in Cambridge and also being a uh, provost for yep. a long time in the US system. And she described the Oxbridge system as one in which you started diving very, very deep and then branching out, a reverse T. Whereas the US system, when you started from the broad limb, and then after that, diving very deep. So the question to ask is, which is the better system? Oxford and Cambridge won't change, so they're going to stick to that system. The US, and I think for different people, it's different. Uh, I'm not sure what our system is, maybe a hybrid of some, but we are also trying to find out and we're experimenting, which is why we did Yale NUS, which is why when I was in the Ministry of Education, we did SUTD, SIT. We're always trying different models 
So, because we believe that each Singaporean, different Singaporeans are just different, and you have to have a system which caters to various groups, but the key goal is the same. I want to maximize your potential as much as I want to maximize some other potential in terms of arts, uh, literary excellence, for example. And I think if we can promote that breadth of talent, I think it's just much better for us. In fact, if I may add, I think one of the criticisms leveled uh, against our system is that there's too much of emphasis on technology, not enough on the heart. That's been one of the criticisms leveled. And just as a cautionary note, if you continue to say what you said in the last line, you could die of unnatural causes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's move on. To, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Yuan Chen, a year three environmental studies student. The US military recognizes the threat of climate change and is investing in uh, renewable energies, more efficient weapon systems, and is trying to reduce oil dependency. Given that MINDEF and SAF has a large, uh, control a large area of land in Singapore, and SAF itself has a large uh, carbon footprint, how is uh, SAF trying to be greener? Thank you. Greener? Yeah. Oh. Uh, we'll have to follow industry trends because, I mean, we can, we, we can you know, sort of uh, have a demonstration effect, but uh, even on a global scale, we're, uh, we're not a great consumer. I'm talking about global scale. But I had a very interesting conversation with the Secretary of Navy, U.S. Navy, recently. Uh, he's a great believer in uh, green. And they have shown, not only shown, they have used, actually, he told me, and this is public anyway, that one of their aircraft carriers uses uh, fuel entirely from uh, um, recycled. Mm. This is recycled. Mm. Fuel waste. Uh, waste that's powering their fighters on, on, on top of their carriers. Wow. And he has a vision, which is a grand vision, of a whole carrier group. Mm. You're talking about aircraft carrier, submarines, fighter aircraft, completely on recycled energy, renewables. He says that the economics are such, he's so passionate about it that I, I almost started buying oil from him there and then, but, <laughs> you know, but he, he believes that the economics have come down to such a sustainable level that he's able to do it. So my response to him, if, uh, if to facilitate, uh, I told him I was very interested because you know, there are carriers come to our dock in Changi Naval Base and uh, when they come, they use a lot of it. Uh, energy and I said well, I'm very happy to facilitate for local companies to, to purchase those uh, types of energy, especially gas, to, to be able to load them up when they need to. So uh, we are conscious we want to be green uh, but uh, really uh, the problem is a global one and it's a very complex one because if you look at what's happening at the talks at the for example, climate change talks. One of the strands of conversation is this, and you can't easily solve it. The developing countries are saying this. Look, you developed countries, you had your time where you really, really you had a huge, you were a large carbon producer. Now that you're developed and you've gone through that process, you are telling us now that we can't develop. Mm. So there are practicalities, and that's, that explains why you know that Australia, the Rudd government introduced the carbon tax. Yep. And um, for a variety of reasons, uh, that didn't get off. So I, 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 I worry and I, and, I, and I think that if you want to make progress again, you have to have uh, other areas of science, whether it's carbon sequestration, whether it's uh, biologic producers of of, of energy, such as in algae, and I hope the NUS can be a forefront in this. This is a big area that government, will, I will tell you, will be willing to fund, if, if even for startups, even for basic research, because we know that that's the way that the world will be in 20, 30 years' time. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm a gay man. I'm obviously an alumni member. Um, 
I'm not going to ask you a green question, though you may be expecting it, because you've Sorry, really given... Sorry, could you, could you closer to the mic? We can't hear you. Thank, I, you. Uh, Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, yes. better. I would like to ask the minister, um, I would like to go back to a broader, go back to his, what he um, talked about, which is values. Not uh, how we fight, but what we are fighting for, or what we are defending. And um, may I say, without making a long speech, that uh, I think you know, our first generation of leaders had tremendous challenges and they've been very successful in uh, meeting and managing them. But in many ways, I think our current leaders have even more challenges because the world is different, but not only that, they have to manage the success of the previous generations. So may I just, you mentioned five values that you felt were worth defending from your personal experience, and I fully agree with you on all of them. Can I just ask you, were there or are there any values that you think our leadership or Singaporeans are still holding on to, which perhaps could be discarded? You know, we all know about creative destruction, or if not discarded, at least significantly changed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gay. Well, nice to see you again. I mean, Gay was an uh, NMP, and you remember. Uh, and, uh, uh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> Are there values that I think ought to be discarded? Uh, not so much discarded as refined or improved. Uh, I believe that at a very basic level, Singaporeans are extremely generous. At one-to-one -one level. So let's take the issue of foreign workers. Uh, when I go down on the ground and speak, uh, and I, I'm, you know, in Topayo, it's a, not a rich estate. Uh, I have 30% rentals, uh, but there are some blocks that there are foreigners there, and a house there. But if you see them at the daily interaction level, extremely generous. And the interaction is great, they joke together. But somehow, uh, when it translates to at a national level, there becomes the noise and... So that's one where I feel that uh, we should treat somebody who is uh, in our country as we would others when we visit them treat us. That's just a simple rule. Uh, because when I travel, and you know, well, there's education and we have a lot of Singaporeans uh, actually uh, staying in other places and studying other places as well. So that's one area which I think we, we can be, continue to be open. And I think that actually at the basic level we are. Uh, the second value which I think I'm a little bit worried about is the focus on families. Where I feel that uh, the strength of that family commitment and the integrity of the family as the basic social unit is under stress. Uh, I'll give you a few, one or two examples. I, I do my house to house, uh, and the lady who comes up is, uh, looks about 60 or 70, and I say, who are you staying with? And she said, I stay with my parent. So my, I'm doing my mathematics, if she's 60 and 70, you know, so where's your parent? And I can guess it. My parent is in a room, bed bound, and, uh, and so I go in and say hello to. And sometimes they're incapacitated. Sometimes they're not. They just mm. are, are bed bound. And then I ask, you know, where are your uh, other siblings? Oh, they're living in their own houses, and I was the one that was not married, so I'm taking care of my parent. So I ask practical questions. As, do they give you money? Yes, which is very good. And, and some are very good. They hire a maid to help as well. So I, I see this happening because Topayo is one of the fastest aging towns in Singapore. And uh, this lady who uh, opens the door is 70 today. But I ask my grassroots, in 10 years' time, she'll be 80. And if she, for any reason, and if only two of them are staying, then who takes care of, of mm. both? 
So we started working, we've gotten VWOs, and I, I'm very greedy. I, I told all my, uh, you know, all the various agencies, any VWO that you have who, who wants to take care of elderly, I'm going to find space for them in my topayo. Just come. And I have assembled them. But that cannot be the first line of defense, neither the first line of care. And I'm concerned that in our, in our, in our, way, in our, in our desire to strengthen the social safety nets, that we inadvertently send a message that weakens the family unit as the primary unit which when something happens, my first defense is, oh, I'm going to call my brother, sister. And for the children, it's instinctive that I have to take care of you. Because if we send a message that, well, your first line of defense can be the state, and when the state can't take care of you, then the family comes in. Number one, I don't think that's sustainable. By 2030, you will have almost a million people above 60 or 65. Number two, I think that's fundamentally not where the strength of our society, our Singapore society came from. Because even though 30 or 40 years ago we were poor, I never felt unsupported. And we can be a rich country, and if we feel that we are unsupported, I think there is something fundamentally wrong that has, come, that has occurred. And I would want to preserve as strong as possible. So I'm very pro-family policies. When it comes to housing policies, uh, so is common one. You know, we, we say we want to make sure that we actually want to give a lot of privileges for those who want to stay with near their, their parents and have three generations. We actually, but, you know, how do you do it? And that's the difficulty. I, I, I'm very pro-family policies where you, you create space for families, where you make sure that the children, uh, uh, preschool, is, is, is something very important, so we've tried to bring as many preschool as possible. And I will tell you that uh, one of the problems with, and Vishwa knows this well because he's in the parliament, that as our society gets richer, the ones at the bottom, it's not money. It's that uh, dysfunctional families. Yeah. I had a school when I was in MOE that I visited in, in my area again, uh, of which I think nearly about 40% came from rental flats. Mm. So I asked the teacher, and then, you know, when I visit schools, we do it without fanfare. I was in MOE and we still do it. I, I think they still do it where you just visit schools on the choir and ask the teachers what's happening on the ground. And you, you visit an area, a school, which is very fairly, you know, as you pointed out, children come from fairly well-to-do background means and another school where this in this particular school 30 to 40 percent for rental flats and the teachers there told me you know we try very hard because a lot of our students come from latchkey mm. families and when they come during school term we try to change the habits but when there's a school break and the longer the school break the worse it gets after the school break and term starts all the old habits come back I says, well, this is a very experienced teacher. She's telling me exactly what I want to know, and she's candid, which is wonderful. So I says, what's your strategy? She says, well, I try to keep them in school for as long as possible. I don't send them back home. <laughs> so that got me thinking, and when, uh, at that time, we were redesigning schools, I asked my officials, when you're building school, can you create added space that will always be there for any VWO that wants to come in to do student care for you. Because it isn't fair for the teachers to just mm. take on these mm. social aspects. But can you create the space so that there is at least you can offer to anybody who wants to come and says, you come here, these kids after school hours, you just give them tuition, keep them as long as possible in the school. Well, ultimately, they have to go back but it's, it's making best of a situation that's difficult because this teacher wasn't telling me things that was politically correct. She was telling me, look, if I send them back, 
their father is in jail, their mother is in trouble, the other, you know, they, they fall into bad company. And she's telling me, exactly as it is. And we need teachers like that who can, you know, know the reality, who, who are very close to the ground, but are able to just, and we have passionate teachers. So, uh, if you ask me what, what values that we, we need, it's not money. Uh, it's time with these children, even some form of surrogate pa parenting for a meantime so that you actually relieve the, the parents from, from, because you know, they need to do other things. And we need to pay more attention to that because that's where uh, part of our society can be failing and not catching up. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we have how many minutes? About 15, 20 minutes. Let's extend it a bit. I think the minister is getting into a certain momentum. So uh, uh, let's extend it. If you all are okay, um, you know, just another 15, 20 minutes. Let's keep, perhaps, minister, we could just take a few more questions. Huh? Let's take both your questions at the same time. Yes, King Jun. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Yu King Jun, MUS Business School alumni. I have an observation. I have an observation and a personal question. My observation is I am truly touched by your sharing with us of your humble beginnings. And I am also gratified to know that you met your wife on campus, which means you are a campus couple because I'm doing some work for <laughs> the business. He wants money. Yes. <laughs> that aside, okay, my personal question is this. You have spoken for good one hour, and I'm bringing you back to the NUS context. And I'm wondering, I have this disconnect. You are a medically trained professional. But what doesn't come through is that you have made use of your medical school training and you're doing what you're doing. So my question is, is it a calling or is it your, your multidisciplinary talents that you are that you've got that you're doing what you are doing today? Or oh, if I could be critical, uh, have you wasted resources that were spent on you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. I pay taxes. <laughs> good evening, sir. Hello, sorry. Good evening, sir. I'm Dennis. I'm from Yale NUS. Uh, so earlier there was a discussion about the will to fight. And I was in a question and answer session last year by the then chief of army, Ravinder Singh, I think. And a He's young still the chief of army. He's still chief of army. I thought they changed it. Okay, so um, <laughs> um, so there was one young Malay man who raised an issue, a problem he faced during national service, which was that he felt that due to some training requirements, he wasn't allowed to have go for his Friday prayers, and then um, so he felt that he was giving up his religious rights to fight for for for, for Singapore, and he wasn't happy with that. And so the the response was that um, we all have to make some sort of sacrifices for national service and there are some sort of training requirements that mean that you have to give up certain kind of your rights. And I think, is, is, is this still the same kind of position that the ministry still holds? Because I feel it's a very dangerous position to hold, especially considering our neighbours around us and the kind of um, values that they hold, especially with China, the kind of um, vitriol that people like ex leaders of our neighbours already hold towards Singapore and our treatment of certain races. And, and, and also from personal experience, it seems like uh, while I was serving national service, a lot of my Malay colleagues um, felt like they were, they were like discriminated against from applying to the more pres prestigious vocations, things like reconnaissance for instance. They felt like they weren't allowed to go to these vocations because of a low security clearance that's inherently based on their race. So if, if, that's, if that's not a case and that's not a criteria, which I believe it, it is not really, it's not a criteria, then it would be useful to clear up these misconceptions because currently I think what's affecting the will to fight is a lot of people feel, especially a lot of people feel that there's discrimination along racial lines and, and that may be a reason for losing the will to fight. So I think it's, it's useful if you clear up some of those misconceptions if they are. Thank you. Uh, so, did did they waste money on me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, when I was a surgeon, uh, when I cut people, at least my anesthetist put them to sleep. In politics, they cut you while you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> was, was that for the media? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just yeah. joking. Uh, well, I, 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 I think your question is, you know, can you apply whatever you learned in med school, in politics? 
Uh, I don't know. I think that uh, as doctors, you see many people, obviously, and you deal with people. And uh, for me, as a cancer surgeon, uh, I, I dealt with uh, uh, pain. Not physical pain only, but uh, the pain of knowing a diagnosis, uh, the pain of... Uh, I had once a patient that said, uh, because I, I, I ended up doing a lot of breast cancers, for some reason or other, uh, and then she's this particular lady had breast cancer, and she was obviously devastated. And uh, as a young doctor, I would start off, uh, you know, by trying to be very clinical, very professional, you know, charts, five-year survival rates that we have, very knowledgeable. Me, big doctor, you know, me know everything. Don't worry, you know. 10-year survival rates, type of treatment, blah, 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 blah. Then, after a while, I found that didn't work. People didn't connect. People, you know, she was, they were sobbing away because you told them you had breast cancer and here you are showing more charts and you, you told them that the 10-year survival rate is 90%. You're trying to make them, uh, comfort them by saying that they're 90%, but they break down even more because they see themselves in the 10%. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I changed after a while. Luckily, better late than never. And, you know, so there was one particular, and different patients are different. So there was one particular patient, and she says, you know, what do I do now that I have breast cancer? So I said, uh, she came in with a book. I said, uh, that's a thick book, right? She said, yeah. I said, oh, don't worry, you read many more thick books. I said, don't worry, you'll be all right. So, uh, some it worked, some says, what do you mean I'll be all right? What do I, can, can I have statistics? And then, okay, then you give them the statistics. So, uh, medicine teaches you to deal with people, to deal with felt needs versus real needs, to deal with symptoms versus diagnosis. So, in a recent uh, Sherpa conference that we had, the Shangri-La Dialogue, a uh, very knowledgeable think tank, th uh, academic from a think tank said, you know, this problem with uh, Japan and China's uh, Senkaku, Tiao Yi, and, you know, and this, this, this. So I, I said, well, I think that's a symptom. And the real problem is really, you know, so on and so forth. So there are instances where training in medicine uh, spills over. But uh, I, I, I think that uh, if you want to enter politics, and I still think that politics in Singapore is a noble calling. Gay asked what, uh, I, I guess, what values and what I was concerned about. I'm very concerned, my central concern is that because the political climate now is a little bit more raucous, that good people will shy away from stepping forward. Because if ever that happens, if good people shy away from stepping forward, then nature abhors a vacuum, and those that come in uh, may not be the, the best people, the brightest people with the noblest of intentions. And we need good leaders. So I'm not sure whether medicine contributes to making good politicians, but I'm very thankful for NUS for, for uh, the education I received and for meeting my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I suppose that's as good it, a quick answer. I guess it also allows, it also taught you to do postmortems. <laughs> <laughs> no, I yeah. didn't do pathology. No, no. <laughs> uh, I think you, you are obliged to answer the question from the gentleman. Yes, sorry. The younger gentleman. Uh, yes. Uh, this was a problem that, uh, if you saw, for those of you who are old enough, uh, Minister Mentor Lee Kuan Yew gathered a group of M Malay professionals and at that time, you know, Go Chok Tong, current PM, and had a frank heart-to-heart -heart talk with the Malay community and shared our, and that was then. I can't remember, that must have been 30, more, 30, 40 yeah, years 30. ago. I would say that we've progressed very much beyond that. Uh, we have Malays in every vocation. We have Malay pilots, we have 
Malay commandos. We have, you know, so, uh, and recently we have uh, the, uh, chief of our third div, was it sixth div? Sixth div. Sixth six div was uh, Brigadier General Ishak. And we have, you know, 369 division, you know, and one of them is a Malay general. So I think that we've progressed very much. Uh, the issue about whether we respect uh, religious, if you like, uh, preferences or requirements. Uh, I mentioned how in our, in, in our previous uh, discussions, we had preserved common space, secularism. And we've gone through this, and it's something very difficult because, you know, at a face value, it's, if somebody says, look, why can't I, 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 I uh, wear clothes in a certain way? Why can't I, I eat, you know, eat in a certain way? Why can't I? And at face value, you says, well, why not? Certainly, we should allow it. But uh, one of the effects that you see in a community is that that common space, because we are multinational, because we have many religions, becomes less and less. And I'll give you a very practical example. With no disrespect to any religion. In our community functions, we used to have, uh, you know, we eat together, right? Yeah. And then because uh, people are becoming more religious, which is fine, which is great, you know, people wanting to seek God cannot be a bad thing inherently, it's a wonderful thing. So there was a feedback that if you serve uh, alcohol on the table, I'm not going to sit with in that table. Now, some would say, yeah, I think that's, that's right. The person is feeling religious. Uh, and, but what happened practically was that races started segregating. And so I had to, and these are not the sort of things that you want to have a public forum over. Because you know that in public forums, people are going to take positions and say, I want to preserve my religiosity. You cannot stop me from doing that. So I've not found that very, very useful. I just basically on the ground, talk to my grassroots, talk to the Muslim leaders, the Muslims, the Indians, the Hindus, and say, look, can we accommodate? If this guy wants to drink and he calls for a bottle of beer, uh, can you sort of excuse him and still, but still sit with him? Because otherwise, I will have to put different religions in different tables. And that was exactly what was happening. I didn't ask for it. But the planners themselves, just taking the tune, sort of taking the cue, this plan, and this was this table, this was so on and so forth. I think for Singapore, it weakens us. And we have to make sure that you preserve that space, that white space, that everyone finds commonality and continues to expand. I visited a school district. I'm sorry, I'm taking a bit more yeah. long. I visited a school district in Canada. And Canada is the complete opposite of how they implement this. Who's from Canada? Great country. Wonderful. You know, I think they're so lucky. You know. And I, this was an MOE and they show I wanted to visit a Canadian school. Because everywhere I go I visit schools to have a sense of what's going on. But they show me a school and lo and behold when they opened it was a school next to a community center. When they opened that community center, I've never seen such a room so full of Sikhs, mm. S-I-K-H-S, Sikhs. There were like 200 Sikhs in a weekday afternoon. So I was wondering, you know, I said, what's happening? You know, and the school, 95% were from Punjab, you know. So I said, well, what's happening? You know, how, how is this? He says, well, in, in, in Canada, we encourage this. Mm. We encourage you to... Uh, if you like, preserve your traditions from your, the place that you came in. And uh, if you come together, we will hire people who, who, who can fit into that. So that was the outcome of their system, and they've managed it. Uh, a very geographically concentrated area, and I believe that Singapore could have gone that way. In fact, Singapore was that way 40, 50 years ago. Geylang had a particular character. Chinatown had a particular character. And we decided that, look, we really ought to have levers in which we create and 
you remember yesterday, MND is even saying that quotas for foreigners. That's very much in our DNA. Are we right? Are we wrong? Will the public support us? You have to decide. Because the last generation and my generation believe that that's still probably the right thing. But if the next generation believes, let's change, let's go, if you like, the Canadian way, let's live with the fact that you can have a precincts of, of, of Chinese, a precincts of Indians, Pakistans, Bangladeshis, a precincts of Indo-Chinese, and then we'll live with which really happens around all the world as the norm. Uh, that's a better system for us, then we'll have to go that way. Yeah. But somehow, uh, my instincts tell me that what we have is precious because the racial harmony is such a, you know, a defining feature for our system that I would keep that and I would preserve it as much as possible. Minister, if, if I could <clears throat> just join you to make a statement. Uh, who's the gentleman who asked the question? Sorry, where? I didn't get your name, sorry. Dennis. Dennis. Uh, le let, me, let me take the liberty of, of sharing a very quick an anecdote, <clears throat> something which I shared in Parliament, which you would remember, Minister. Mm. When I served in my national service capacity as CEO of a battalion, um, we went on an overseas very tough mission exercise. It was in summer, extremely hot, above 42 degrees, right? It was on, in the month of Ramadan. Naturally, my Muslim soldiers said they had to fast. You're talking about average of maybe 30, 40, 50 kilometers a day of walking in that heat and uh, fasting. I was concerned about dehydration, so I told them, look, you don't have to do it. You can be exempt. But this is what my Muslim soldiers told me. He said, they said, we will not, we will do it, sir, because that's a requirement of our religion. And second, if we don't do it, if we don't continue, then our buddies will have to carry our load. And then the most amazing thing happened. The other soldiers, non-Muslims, said that they would also go without water. And we did, as a battalion. So this you see- something very special. No, it's special and, it's and you special. will find it. And this is what makes it special, living in Singapore. So it's whether you want to see the bottle as half full or half empty. I choose to see the bottle as half full because these are the memories that shape my attitude towards my country. But there may be many other instances where there are examples of discrimination and everything else. But I'm defined, I choose to be defined by this episode. That's what I want to share with you. As a citizen of the country, and I've never been a regular in the army, so I'm not beholden to say those things. But I think it's important for us as Singaporeans to share this. And it's a unique experience that you, don't, you may not experience not in many other countries. That's why it's not alone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, my name is Nuning. I'm from uh, business school. I'm an exchange student. Uh, I was really interested on the discussion of that you see Singapore as vulnerable. Uh, in terms of that, you see your country as vulnerable. Uh, do you think that it is better for the country to have more diplomacy strategy rather than having the defense strategy? Because like, if I see your country, you have three uh, military airport. So it's like kind of giving a message to the neighbors that you are ready for any kind of attack. So. I was thinking, like, I think the diplomacy strategy might be better for you. Like, if we see uh, Australia, like, they have the neighbor and then they have a good diplomacy strategy that, that now they have really good relationship with, us, with the neighbors. So, what do you think about that? Thank you. Can Thank we you. have the next question, please? We? We'll have to end with this. Uh, okay, we'll allow. Our senior citizen, yes. Hi, uh, I'm Valerie from UNUS. I feel that for a very long Mike, time now. Bring it, bring oh, him up. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I feel that for a very long time now, Singapore has always seen vulnerability as a form of weakness and it has engendered a culture of fear and insecurity among us. Um, but in reference to Brene Brown's TED Talk on vulnerability, she said that vulnerability feels like truth and sounds like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they're never weakness. I feel that we should see vulnerability as such, as an avenue for us to be brave and to be open. And so I was wondering, is there a way that we can um, reframe and relook the vulnerabilities of Singapore such that instead of using vulnerability as a rhetoric which inevitably results in a climate of fear and insecurity among us. How about we use vulnerability as uh, an inspiration for us to be courageous instead? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, for both the questions uh, and your assertions, I agree with you. Uh, for the first point about whether it's better for Singapore to engage in defence diplomacy rather than build uh, a, a defence capability, obviously they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're complementary. We hope never to use our military capabilities. That's why we have them. Uh, and whether we can reshape our vulnerabilities as something positive uh, for truth and courage, I think that's exactly the point. Yeah. Uh, if uh, Vishwa made the point, uh, the technology is there, the platforms are there, and I'm very thankful that our constant investments into building a defense have, have uh, and defense experts know that we have significant capabilities that uh, we, are, we are a very advanced military now. Uh, but uh, these are just mere machines. Without the will uh, to defend what we protect, as people know, then you risk losing it. Uh, this is not a challenge to anyone. This is just to say to every, anyone who would be a potential aggressor, uh, we are willing to defend what we have. Uh, we will continue to fight for our rights. And we are a sovereign nation. Uh, we, we want to maintain the right to make our choices, even if you think they're wrong. Uh, and from time to time, uh, people tell us what choices to make. And I think having a strong SAF helps us to be able to make the right choice. Doctor, mm, I have two questions. The first one, there's a Chinese saying, "How nan putang ting." That means the good boys will never be a soldier. But of course, by law, all must go and serve. Mm. Now I'm asking whether you should extend the national service to permanent residents, because eventually they will become citizens, right? Yeah. So, will the defense minister consider whether to call up all the perm yes. permanent residents? You, you do okay. know that permanent residents are already required to do uh, national service, right? Oh, second generation. Ah, so I was going to qualify. And the reason, is, is, the distinction is this. Uh, for instance, if you are an older permanent resident, or even an older Singapore citizen, you become a citizen not because you were born here, but came here. And let's say you came you know, in your late, uh, in your 30s. Uh, it's difficult. And some would say, well, you know, it's difficult for us to make you do NS at that time. So that's what we call the first generation PR. But if your children who grew up here in Singapore and studied here and became PRs, uh, you have the same liabilities as citizens to do NS. But before you give someone permanent residency, mm. should you not perhaps get a written undertaking that they will make their children do national service? You could. Uh, the question is, you know, what happens if they don't? Because uh, undertakings are, I mean, you, a lot of people can do undertakings. So it, it's actually, uh, we tell them that they have to do it. So in fact, the form is quite clear when they sign it that they know that their children have to do it. So uh, I've made the point publicly if, uh, and I'll say it again here, if you think that your children, who are going to be permanent residents, are not going to do national service, my advice to you as Minister of Defence is, you as a parent uh, shouldn't take up, shouldn't be a PR. Because only become a PR when you're committed to Singapore and you know that your children are willing and going to do national service. Because I will tell you, at the same time, like Singaporeans, the penalties if your child, who is a permanent resident, 
and liable for national service, doesn't do national service, are very severe. So that's the consequences. Yeah, those are exactly the same. People as know there are consequences. Okay. Okay. Now, my last question is for those who do the NS but injure themselves yes. and cannot earn a living. Mm. So what is the government going to do about it? We have a compensation framework uh, that we exp I explained in Parliament. And you remember we had a very unfortunate instance for one of our Navy yeah, men yeah, who was, Navy. you know. Uh, and uh, monetarily wise, there are awards that we pack to various schemes that are uh, you know, uh, nationally recognised. And on top of that, we give added amounts. But Really, we have to support them. And we made it a point for Jason to try to rehabilitate, even though he's lost three limbs, to get him back to work. And to me, that's the biggest challenge. So I'm thrilled to death that I, I told him and I, and I said, when I visited him in hospital, I thought that would be the only and last time I would see him. <laughs> because he was in ICU uh, and prognosis wasn't very good, but to see him bounce back to be competing in uh, uh, table tennis yeah. is enormous. When he told me that he, he's, he's, he was swimming, that he could mobile on his own, he, he lives next to the MRT. So, he, so I said, how do you get to your training? Well, I take the MRT. I says, how do you get to the MRT? Because he's only got one hand and two fingers. Uh, and he, says, and he showed me you know, how he's able to dress himself. So I was delighted that you know, he's plugged in and for him to get into the network with uh, Nick who came here and uh, uh, Nick who's born without, you know, mm. uh, and with Aisha. Uh, we are fully committed to help individuals try to rehabilitate them. But our compensation framework, in direct question to you, direct reply to your question is fair. Uh, it's packed to national schemes, and on top of that, we give extra amounts. Thank, Thank you. you. Minister, can we end with just taking two questions? We've had plenty of questions from the... By the way, this is webcast live, and we're having several questions coming online. And I, if you could just answer two questions. The first question is related to what, what was just asked. In the light of promoting transparency in Singapore, especially between the government and the people, what is the current point of view with regard to transparency held by the Ministry of Defence? And, and I, would, I would say that, you know, there was a time when people like us when did national service, uh, the Ministry of Defence wasn't as transparent when someone was injured and so on, right? Um, today, how, what's the level of transparency and what accounts for it? What are your key um, considerations? I'm, so, I'm not sure what the transparency... Am I going to tell you how I'm going to fight? No. You wouldn't want me to tell you how I'm going to fight. Uh, because everyone knows uh, uh, we don't share plans. And, uh, because if I share a plan, and it's, it's not productive. If I share a plan, you have a counter plan, and then I'll have the counter plan to your counter plan. You know. So let's uh, keep up the pretense. But actually, uh, in, in military terms, it's quite clear uh, what capabilities are. Uh, and Singapore is not very big, as I said. What, what, what can you hide? <laughs> 700 square kilometers. Uh, as as a lady mentioned, you can see our airports. And if you see, uh, you know, you use Google Maps, you can, you can scan and see what's roughly there. So our, our fighter planes, you can, you can see what, what we have, F-15s, F-16s. When we are thinking of purchasing uh, F-35s, we tell you so. We have Leopard tanks. Uh, uh, we have some capabilities that we don't share them. Well, obviously, all countries have that. So I think that's we're within the envelope of transparency uh, quite well. And I would say that our procurement services, we are quite well regarded in the defence industry. We are known as a shrewd buyer, which means a very tough buyer. We ask a lot of questions. And uh, in relation to that question from the, the gentleman on science, the reason why we're able to procure very well is that we have so many scientists and engineers who ask a lot of questions. And they, you know, suppliers think that they don't know, they really don't realize how sophisticated our scientists are, and so they get befuddled. And there are many iterations, so I think that's very good. So I think we're fairly, we're, you know, we're fairly okay. Uh, so I'm not sure in terms of transparency about I, what. I guess that there are two areas, if, mm. I, if I understand it correctly. One, one area would be, you know, injuries, death. Mm -hmm. 
uh, accidents. That we're all very, very transparent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that in fact, we, we give you uh, every time an incident occurs, even if, if it's uh, outside not training related. Yeah. And because there is no reason for us to hide it. We want to know it ourselves and because we want to make sure that safety is a real issue. And I guess the other, the other factor is, mm. is about the defence budget. It's been commented several times that uh, all other ministerial budgets are under scrutiny in mm. the Committee of Supply debate mm. in Parliament, except very much for the defence mm. budget. Uh, perhaps you may want to comment on what account, what's the reason for that? Well, all budgets are scrutinised. And uh, in Parliament, and when it, uh, Viswa is referring to budget and uh, Committee of Supply, which will be in February and March, uh, questions are asked and no different from in there. How do you spend your money? How do you make sure that it's countable? And uh, we do spend a large proportion of government spending on defence uh, because we're trying to make up, for example, if you need early warning, you need better planes and... Uh, the G550s that we have in the sky telling you when uh, the skies are dangerous are expensive. They're very sophisticated and their ability to respond. Our, our radar systems are, are state of art. Uh, we have many assets which are uh, state of art. We buy them and then we upgrade them to great capabilities. So you're quite right, it's about 12 billion. It's the largest component of government spending. But uh, we've always said that we only spend what we need. And ultimately, uh, we're elected by the people. If the day the Singaporeans say, I'm not going to bring you into government because I don't believe in a strong defence, then you have a weaker defence, then we spend less. It's up to the people. But as long as uh, uh, this government is in charge, we believe in a strong defence. We believe that that's the only way to ensure that we have the ability to protect what we've built up and there's more and more to protect. And I think that we will be, I think that Singaporeans are responding to the region even though it's more trouble with calm. It's a reflection that they believe that they are well protected. And I think that's worth the price. It is a high price, but it's value. Minister, perhaps we could end with a question that would probably bring us back to the very first point that you made about values. Uh, this one has the largest number of questions, people asking the same question, uh, close to 40 people asking the same question. Do you think the proportion of the defence budget in comparison to the healthcare budget is misaligned? How should Singapore justify its defence spending? You have to build both. They're not mutually exclusive. You have to ensure that if you want a defence force, it must be effective. Because you can spend less and have a uh, half-baked force that really you might as well not spend much, which I will tell you that other countries have gone into. And we don't believe that. Uh, I think that the right answer to both questions is that you must have an economy that can produce enough wealth for you to satisfy not only defence, not only health, education uplifting social nets and we must be the only many of you must be students of, 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 of economics and in the last decade if you look at the reversal of fortunes there are very very few countries in the world that have our fiscal strength right all experts there are few if any countries with our fiscal strength, where our dollar is strong, where our dollar is appreciating, and our, even though we are increasing social spending, we are still able to live within the budget. The day that our economy continue, doesn't grow, then we are talking about not only how to cut defence, how to cut health, how to cut education, how to cut housing. That's exactly what's happening in Europe. I asked during the global financial crisis the people that were crossing around, where would you prefer to have been in the last decade, 01 to 010? And if I asked you in 2001 to 2010 or 2013, how turbulent a period it was in our region, 2001, 9-11, 2002, Bali bomb blast, 2004, 05, SARS, 2008 global financial crisis. There was one more in between. Eh? People forget. Uh, I said it. 2004, change of prime ministers. 
in many countries, that's a big difference. Did you feel the last decade as a turbulent one? Were we talking about rising structural unemployment, youth unemployment? We must be among the very few countries in the world where in the last five years, employment for the most vulnerable group, age 55 to 64, grew by 10%. Employment, I'm not talking about unemployment reduction. The actual number of jobs created for the, one of the hardest groups, age 55 to 64, grew by 10%. There is a term which I don't like to use because it's hubris. There's an exceptionalism. We have to recognize it, not from hubris, but to recognize that the fundamentals that got us here are very precious, are very rare, and very hard to get just the right balance. You can lose it very quickly, as many countries in Europe would. I visited Barcelona and Madrid. General unemployment, 25%. Youth unemployment, over 50%. A whole generation will grow up for the next 10 to 15 years, half of which would have not worked for the prime of their life. Where would you rather have been in the last decade? I hope that in a decade hence, we will still answer the question, where would you rather have been from 2020 or 2025? Still here because we are willing and able to do the right things. Because the fortunes can change. Europeans have great capability, great assets that they've built up. And yet even then, nations change and the fate of nations change. It will be a depth of complacency, uh, just pride or arrogance if we believe that the same thing cannot happen to us. Our exceptionalism is only exceptional when we are willing to do the right things. Thank you. Thank you. That, that sounded almost like an election rally speech. Ah. No. Uh, <laughs> but, but I must say, I must say, uh, I'm very grateful to you, Minister, for, for sharing your views in as candid a manner as is possible. Let's face it, when you talk about defense-related issues, it's not possible to be 100% candid because there are sensitivities. You know. But I, I'm amazed by how candid you have chosen to be today, and, and I thank you for it. Uh, and, and I believe part of that reason, or a significant part of that reason, is because of the reason for that is because you feel comfortable, mm. because this is home ground. Home ground, you know, <laughs> and not just because we are NUS, but because by and large we are Singaporean. And I think at some point we should be able to look each other in the eye and speak as members of the same family. Um, and and it doesn't mean that we need to agree with everything that you said. In fact, it'll be very odd if we do. I think what's important is you have brought out issues that would necessarily provoke further thinking. And, I, and I, on, on that score, I think, I think we really need to thank you because it's not often that you find opportunities where we have, we have our political leaders speaking to us in a manner that provokes sufficient thought. And I say that with a certain amount of lament. And I, and I reiterate what I said at the start, I wish there'd be more occasions where our political leaders show us who you really are, and without apology. And there's no need for apology. You have your scars, we appreciate them. Sometimes we may, we may even see them as beauty charms. <laughs> On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to join me once again to thank uh, Dr. Ng Eng Hen, our Minister for Defense. And, and more importantly, our alumnus. Yeah. <laughs> and we can't let him go back empty-handed, so we've got something for you. Oh. We've got a picture of you with a very handsome man. Oh, how nice. Picture oh, of us, yeah. which we took just now. Yeah, you yeah. trace pictures back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Thank Minister. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And, uh, and Minister, if you could just pen certain thoughts here of how wonderful your experience was today. <laughs> and if it's possible, if you could show that to the, to the camera. If possible, not the way doctors write. <laughs> because George Juan wrote it and we're still trying to decipher it. <laughs> He's a renal physician, what do you expect? <laughs> Could you read it, please? Oh, I said great time, very frank and productive. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. We'll pass it to you later. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the minister would be happy to talk to a few of you uh, out there uh, for autographs, photographs, and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll pass it to you later, minister. Thank you.